Back in the day when I worked in law enforcement, one of the things that I had to do as a detective was to <coughs> make plans when we were going to conduct search warrants, and, uh, or when we were going to conduct a raid. And, and you know, you, you can't just go into those things blindly. You have to, you have to develop a, a game plan, a strategy. And I mean, you, it, it had to be planned out pretty much in detail as to what each officer was going to do, what each officer's responsibility was going to be, but you know we had to keep it simple. And there was an actual method that we were taught in planning these things. It was called the KISS principle. Have you ever heard of it? Keep it simple, stupid. Yeah. So that you don't muddy the waters too much and make it more complicated than it needed to be. The less complicated and more simple the plan was, the less chance for something bad happening. The less chance for someone getting hurt, evidence being destroyed, or the bad guy getting away. And uh, I think we need a KISS principle for Christian living. Uh, and I'm not the first person to think that either. John Wesley founder of Methodism, he penned the general rules for Christian living. Uh, the first Christians who called themselves Methodists, he had three principles for their living. And this is very watered down and much less complicated. But one, do no harm. Two, do good. Three, use the means of grace that God has provided for us for our living. But even before that, way back in the early days of the Christian church, Peter saw that there was a need for a simple principle for Christian living. And in just two verses this morning, he lays that out for us. If you look in 1 Peter, as we continue in our study of 1 Peter, chapter 2, verses 11 and 12. It says, Dear friends, I urge you as aliens and strangers in the world to abstain from sinful desires which war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day He visits us. So the principle for holy living is this. Avoid what is sinful and destructive and practice what's good. And we're going to spend the rest of our time this morning expounding on this principle. Before we, before we get into that, we need to catch the tone of Peter's words here. Now, the New International Version I was reading from begins, Dear friends, anybody's Bible here say, Beloved, as it begins? That's probably a better translation. Beloved, I urge you as aliens and strangers. Now, the word beloved, when you take it back to the Greek, is here has its root in the word agape, which is the most selfless and deep and sacrificial kind of love there is. And it's important because Peter is here, he's not trying, trying to bully or coerce the Christians. It's not like he's saying, Friends, I command you to do this. He is speaking out of love. And he wants what's best for his readers or for, for those that are in his charge. And he wants what's best for us. Now imagine that you have, heaven forbid, you have backslid into some sin or other. And two different people confront you on that. You know, that's what we're supposed to do when, when a brother or sister backslides and falls into sinful living. We're to lovingly confront them about such that's another sermon for another day. Not much of that going on in the world around us. But one person comes at you with their finger in your face and their eyes are full of anger and they say, how dare you? What in the world are you doing? It's like you have personally embarrassed them. How would you respond to that? Now the other person has seen you at your best and at your worst. They have proved their love to you time and time again. They are on that short list of people that you would call if you were in real trouble. And this person comes up to you and takes you aside from the other people that you're around. They put their arms around you and they square away shoulder to shoulder and they look you in the eye and say, what in the world are you doing? Didn't say anything different from the first person, but they said it with a lie. 
we would respond better to the person who confronts us in love. It's what Peter is doing here. It's why we need to get the heart, the love, and the compassion behind the words here that Peter is, is sharing or commanding us with. We need to hear that these words are spoken out of love and concern. Now, the first part of this principle is to abstain from sinful desires. First thing Peter tells us is to stop giving in to sinful desires. If we really want to walk as a child of God, then we have to walk in righteousness. We have to stop walking in sin. We have to stop giving in to sinful desires. Well, what are sinful desires? The word for sinful here actually means fleshly or worldly desires. And he describes these in chapter 4, a little bit later. 1 Peter 4, 2 and 3, he says, A true believer does not live the rest of their earthly lives for evil human desires, but rather for the will of God. For you have spent enough time in the past doing what pagans choose to do, living in debauchery, lust, drunkenness, orgies, carousing, and detestable idolatry. And then, of course, over in Galatians chapter 5, Paul contrasts the fruit of the flesh with the fruit of the Spirit. He says the acts of the sinful nature or the fleshly desires are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. Now, that's not the entire list, folks. There are a lot of other things that can go on that list, too, but we get the idea. Sinful or fleshly desires are the very things that Draw us. Advertisements, sales pitches, politicians, and sometimes even our friends tug on us with these things. They promote them. They encourage us to indulge and live the good life. I can remember as a kid back when they had, uh, uh, well, I guess they still do have beer commercials on TV, but one said, go for the gusto. I didn't know what gusto was, but it sounded like a good idea to me. James Boyce, in his commentary on this passage, writes this. In our day, there is little shared understanding of honorable conduct. We have lost the vital connection between the body and the soul. We live in a day that has not only loosened itself from biblical moorings, but even from the ancient Greek classical ones as well. The sad truth is this. We live in a day that is more earthbound and passage-driven than even the most unbelieving in the ancient world. And this is all the more reason to heed <laughs> Peter's call, abstain. So let's try to make this a little more concrete. Peter is telling us to abstain from sinful desires such as sexual impurity. You know, <clears throat> sex is a topic that really ought to be discussed in church. It's set up by God to be a great and glorious thing for a man and a woman who are married. And for no other reason. To populate the world and, and as a gift. And those parameters in the story. Or what about preoccupation with material things that leads us to obsess and steal and spend ourselves into bondage? Sinful desires such as lust for power which leads us to pervert justice and manipulate people and benefit our own desires. You only need to look in the headlines at the leaders of our country and see this played out. Or the... Or the Fleshful desire of always needing to be right. And I have to battle that one all the time. You know, I, I, who, who wants to be wrong? I mean, everybody likes to be right. But I'm not always right, am I? She's like, mm. I'll answer that. No, I'm not. I'm not always right. A lot of the times I'm not right. Notice I didn't say a lot of times I was wrong. So a lot of times I'm not right. Uh, we have to be careful or we will distort the truth. It's just a simple way of lying to make 
to justify what we're doing. Or the fleshly desire of jealousy, bitterness, resentment, hostility, unforgiving, and that poisons everything we do. <clears throat> everything we do. Or the desire to rebel against God by creating our own designer faith and picking and choosing what we like. You know, uh, I don't know if you guys see this, but I see a lot of people who are Christians, but they pick a little bit from the Christian doctrines. They pick a little bit from the Muslim doctrines. They pick a little bit from here and there, and they have custom designed their own faith. The only problem with that is that they have custom designed a God that does not exist. Once again, this list could go on and on, but we, we know where it's going. The command here to avoid abstain from sinful desires is a huge command. You know why? It's because we all have sinful desires. We do. But the problem is, is not everyone wrestles with them. I wrestle with sinful desires. Some people grab onto them and go with them. And they never at once war with them. And we might feel like at times we're being penalized for doing what's right, for being a believer, for standing on God's Word, and being persecuted. Why should we abstain from things that everyone else is doing? Peter gives two simple answers. First he says, because you are aliens and strangers in this world. Now we've already heard this several times in our study of 1 Peter. In, a sense, in, in essence he says, look, as a child of God, you're not like everybody else. You have a different focus. You have different values. You're heading in a different destination with different goals in mind. And because of that, we live differently than everyone else who does not have those same things. Imagine that you were going to Rio next year when they have the Olympic Games. And you get there and you're a citizen of the United States and you were really enjoying your visit there. It's a nice place. You know, hey, I, I, can, I can live in Rio. Yes, yeah, all right. But when the games start, who do you pull for? You pull for the Germans? The Koreans? No. You pull for, for America. You pull for America. Many professional athletes, they come to our country and they play professional sports. But when they go to the Olympics, they play for the country who holds their citizenship. Their allegiance is to that country. While we can enjoy and appreciate the life that we've been given and all that we've been blessed with in this world, you know, but because we're citizens of God's kingdom through the blood of Christ and the mercy and grace of God, we have a different loyalty than those around us. We pursue a different goal. We seek a kingdom that's not of this world. And then secondly, Peter says, we abstain from sinful desires because they will destroy us. He says they war against our souls. These temporary, temporary pleasures and others that, that others pursue, folks, they're like a cancer that eats away our soul and our character. Outwardly, outwardly, when we live that way and profess to be Christians, we appear to be having a good time, but inwardly we are dying. Look at what these desires have done to our society. Infidelity and sexual immorality destroys families and leaves people bruised and damaged, and it has split churches and denominations. And to the point now where kids that are being raised have absolutely no idea as to the way that they are called to live. Although an obsession with material things leaves people enslaved by debt and encourages corruption, deceptions, and all kinds of scams to take others advantage of others. 
You can't hardly walk through the Walmart parking lot for someone trying to hawk something to you because they are so far upside down and behind in this world, they have no idea of what they're looking for or the direction out of the trouble that they're in. Bitterness and hatred incite violence in the world. Thirty years ago, totally different world. Now you have Black Lives Matter, White Lives Matter. The last time I checked, we're all the same. Every one of us is the same. And in Christian teaching and in our book of discipline, it says we hold that all lives are precious in the sight of God. Laziness encourages a sense of entitlement rather than diligence and productivity. We live in a day and age where people don't want to work. They want to sit around and just hold their hand out and wait for somebody to do it for them. I can't remember the exact passage, but in Proverbs it says that we are to consider the ways of the ants and not be sluggards, but to work. Nothing wrong with working. We're commanded to. The worship of power leads to injustice and a sense of lawlessness and promotes violence and competition rather than cooperation. And, and when we live this way, folks, it makes it downright impossible for real growth in Jesus Christ. We lose our unique identity because we are enslaved by our desires and our emotions. We also, we die spiritually because we're fighting God rather than walking with God. Abstaining from sinful desires is a warring battle and we cannot be successful by being passive. Peter commands us to take action. Now, it's our nature to excuse and justify our actions. But we have to stop that. We have to confront the lie that says what we do is not an indication of who we really are. Jesus said, what comes out of your mouth, what comes through the actions of your hands and feet, shows who you really are. We can't separate what we do from who we are. What we do really is who we are. Our behavior in the world reveals what we truly value. It's our true character. Our actions reveal whether or not our faith is real or whether it's only hypocritical. And Peter has given us the, the negative side of this principle for life, and now we turn to the positive side, living consistently. Verse 12 says, Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day He visits us. Plato was told that a certain man had been making slanderous charges against him. He responded, I will live in such a way that no one will believe what he says what Peter is telling us to do here. Peter's been honest about the fact that living as a follower of Christ will cause us to go against the grain of the world. Sometimes it will even bring ridicule. Other times it will make people want to knock us down a few pegs so that they can feel better about themselves because they know they're living in a wrong way. But rather than despair, Peter says we should work hard to live faithful and godly lives with such consistency that it shuts them up. Now think about it. Suppose one of your co-workers goes to the boss and says, you know, they're the laziest person I've ever seen. They're always talking about other people. They're always putting the company down. I can't get nothing out of them. They don't work. You need to get rid of them. And the boss goes and he does some undercover snooping and he spies on you a little bit and, and he finds that you do your job with energy and precision and excellence. And that your attitude is always pleasant. 
that you always speak positively of the company and other workers, and that your production is always equal or above other workers. What do you think that the boss is going to do? Is he going to fire you? No. no. He's going to defend you and maybe put you to the head of that promotion time. When we go against the grain of the world, folks, what does that look like? Well, we, we love those who are unloved. We love those who are cast off by the world. We keep going when life gets hard instead of giving up. We forgive when we are treated shamefully. We listen even when we might not want to hear what somebody has to say. We keep silent to protect the reputation of someone else. We are content even though we might have less than what others have. We keep working at relationships even when that relationship is hard. We are generous instead of self-indulgent. We get involved when we see injustice rather than look the other direction. <clears throat> we love our friends even though we might not always embrace what they do. We choose the way of God joyfully and consistently. And folks, when we live that way, something happens. People begin to see God in us. And people will, em will embrace what is different from what they've always believed and what they've always known only when they see the difference that it can make in, in a human's life. I read an article recently about a man that had been raised in the radical terrorist Palestinian group Hamas. There's a, there's a whole book, but I just read an article about it. He was the son of one of the leaders and became powerful in his, in his own right in the, in the group. He was developing into a hate-filled and violent man, but he changed. He changed because he saw kindness <coughs> in Christian love and action. They didn't offer to love him if he would only change and lead the Hamas. They loved him. They just loved him. They gave him a New Testament. And because they gave it to him as a gift, he read it. And as he read it, he began to see a stark contrasting difference between the approach of Jesus Christ and that of Muhammad. He was drawn to the superior result that came from the power of forgiveness and humility. He saw faith lived out before him before he ever understood the nature of the call of Christ. And his friends then explained the Christian faith. He became a follower of Christ. Even at the cost of being disowned by his family and killed if he would be found. <clears throat> because he was compelled by seeing the truth of Christ lived out in the lives of those people that dared to love him. And Peter says if we will embrace the life of Christ, if we will pursue godliness and self-discipline, then something wonderful will happen. Our critics will perhaps become our brothers and sisters in Christ. Some who presently hate us will embrace us. But the most important thing is that some who are lost and bound for hell will embrace Jesus Christ and join the ranks of the redeemed. Those who curse God will praise God. Chuck Swindoll writes, he says, For unbelievers, earth is a playground where the flesh is free to romp and run wild. But for believers, earth is a battleground. It's the place where we combat the lust that wage war against our souls. For the brief tour of duty we Christians have on this earth, we cannot get stalled in sin, or for that matter, we cannot become incapacitated by its gift. So I'll leave you with three challenges this morning. The first one is live a clean life. It's simple. If you do what's right, 
you won't have to undo near as many things in your life. You'll have less regrets. And you will nurture a continual and deep fellowship with God. You know, it's never wrong to do what's right. Never. It's never wrong to do what's right. It's not always easy. But it's never wrong. And it's always worth the effort. Second challenge. Combat criticism against your faith with consistency. The best way to silence a critic is to live a life that proves them wrong. Consistency starts in little things. The way we do our jobs. The way we clean up the messes in our life. The way we present ourselves. The way we listen to others. The way we handle frustrations. The way we pray. The forgiveness that we extend. The time we set aside for God. The way we use our time, the priorities that we embrace, and the consideration we give to the needs of others. You know, big things come when we first attend to the little things. And then the third challenge is to always remember that the world is watching you. The world is watching you. People notice the way that we live, folks. They do. How many of you have ever heard someone say, those Christians are just a bunch of hypocrites? That's because they are watching. And they are seeing that many professing Christians don't live what they said they believe. When they hear that we profess to be Christians, they're going to watch us more closely to see if there is any sign of <clears throat> in the summer of 1805 in Buffalo Creek, New York, there was a council between the white people and the Indians. And they gathered in Buffalo Creek, and there was uh, a, a brief worship service by the Boston Missionary Society. And after the the sermon, the response was given by a red jacket, one of the leading chiefs. And among many other things, here's what he said. Brother, you say that there is but one way to worship and serve the Great Spirit. If there is but one religion, why do you white people differ so much about it? Why not all agree, as you can all read the same book? Brother, we are told that you have been preaching to the white people in this place here. These people are our neighbors. We're acquainted with all of them. We will wait a little while and see what effect your preaching has upon them. If we find that it does them good and makes them honest and less disposed to cheat Indians, we will then consider again what we have said. When we show the love of Christ, we do it consistently, folks. Not only our words, but with our actions and with our living, it will make an impact. It will. it will open doors for us to share the message of, of hope found in Christ. And to those who see and experience the love, kindness, and compassion that we extend to others, you know, it might just eventually change their thinking. And they may turn to Christ for their own side. If we do these simple things, it will bring honor to our Heavenly Father. I look back on my life and when I've done something to make my parents proud, that was a great feeling to know that they were proud of me. But when Mom would come up and, and give me a hug and say I'm proud of you, and she still does it. Dad was not the huggy, touchy type. But every now and then, just in passing, he'd say, not a boy. was not a better feeling. I cannot imagine how great the joy would be to know that my life and my actions have pleased God. Or what an incredible and awesome thing it would be to hear my Heavenly Father say, 
Hallelujah. Or how wonderful it would be when I finally get to heaven to see people there that would come up to me and say, I'm here because you showed me Christ. I find it hard to think that there will be anything greater than those words and that <coughs> of a proud and So keep it simple. Abstain from sinful desires. Do good. Live consistently. Simple idea. The application is hard, but the results are earth changing.